Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and editor Simon Lambert today is pensions and investments editor Tanya Jeffries and a very special guest, Steve Webb. Over the last six years, Steve has been helping This Is Money readers with their pension queries and fighting a few big battles along the way. Well, this week was his 300th column. So to celebrate that milestone, we've been asking you to send in your questions to Steve. So coming up, Steve will be discussing whether it's better to put your spare cash into a pension or pay off your mortgage faster, how contracting out affects your state pension, whether work pension schemes are compulsory for employers, what to do about the current market turmoil and its impact on your retirement pot, and plenty more. So buckle up, Steve, Tanya and Simon. Here we go. Don't forget you stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. But first, Steve, many congratulations. 300th column. Can you possibly pick out your favourite or perhaps your most impactful? Thanks, Georgie. I think, I mean, every week I enjoy the process of reading the dozens of questions that readers send in and they're just fantastically diverse. So you always pick up something a bit quirky or something you've never thought of before or something that makes you think. So I I learn every week as well as pretending to know what the answers are. I suppose I would have to pick the column that started off the big state pension campaign, the, the one we wrote about a lady who was on a low pension and she and her husband spotted it and they got it increased. But they wondered how long they'd been on a low pension for and we uh, published this Tanya uh, edited it and published it and then um, snowball happened thereafter and we heard from more and more people and and now here we are in the government they've got years to go before they finally fix it all but uh, little did we know when we published that column where it would lead to. Mm, Indeed Simon tell us about bringing in Steve and the work he's done over the last six years. I can't believe it's been six years (laughs) more more to the point actually before you just said that I think he's done a sterling job in terms of the help that he's given our readers, the efforts that have been put in by Steve and by Tanya in getting that information out there to people, the amount of work that I see firsthand goes on behind the scenes, sometimes for questions and stories that readers will never see. It's just somebody's just been helped mm-hmm. out. Um, I think that's really important. And I think it's a really good example of what great financial journalism can be and the power that it can have and there's no greater example of that than the underpaid women's state pension scandal that was uncovered first by somebody writing in with a question and then Steve and Tanya doggedly pursuing that and I was really pleased when that was named campaign of the year in the headline money awards this year I thought that was one of the most well-deserved awards I'd seen in my entire time in in journalism Um, but also it's great because I know that every Monday morning without fail we've got an absolutely cracking story that goes up on the website that loads and loads of people want to read and that makes my Monday mornings so much (laughs) easier than they would otherwise be. Tanya, pension's not the sexiest of subjects but important nonetheless. Yes, well, when Steve started doing his column and I was assigned the job of doing it, I did have a bit of trepidation, I will admit to that now. I thought, oh my goodness, some prima donna politician, goodness (laughs) knows what he's going to be like. But I I have to say, from his very first column, I realised straight away, oh, Steve can write. That was brilliant. And also, he's turned out to be an absolute pleasure to work with. He's really put so much effort into helping individual people it's turned out into a great column over the years and um, long may it continue. Some prima donna politician, eh, Steve? I would never have called you that. Right, enough blowing wind, because, uh, you know, in broadcasting as in journalism, you're only as good as your last question answered or article written or broadcast done. So without further ado, let's get cracking. We've had about 10 questions. Well, we had more than that, but we couldn't do all of them, obviously, because we've only got a certain amount of time on the podcast. So we're just going to get straight into it. And the first one, Could you let me know if it's better to put money in my pension or pay my house off quicker? I'm 48 years old with 20 years left on my mortgage. So, Steve, what are you thinking in this scenario? What are you advising? I think the first thing I'm doing is making sure that debts are under control. So we've got to assume that the mortgage is going to be paid regularly. If it's not, if you haven't got the money to do that, it's secured on your house. So that's got to be in order. It's got to be under control. Although the questioner didn't mention it, there may be other debts. They may be paying credit card or other debts, 20, 30 percent interest. And, you know, getting those things under control is also a pretty high priority. 
assuming all of those things and assuming as well that you can cope with the mortgage rate rise that may be coming because you know mm -hmm. maybe you can afford more for your pension now but you come to the end of a fixed rate mortgage your mortgage costs could double you know again just kind of planning ahead a little bit not just thinking about today but about future bills so although i'm a pensions person i also do debt advice in my spare time and i think getting your debts under control is a good thing so that's the big picture. Having said that, assuming all of those things are in place, in general, money invested in a pension with the benefit of a tax break is going to get you more of a return than the interest you're getting or paying on your mortgage. And in general, you've got to take tax into account. You know, your pension, when you take it out, will mostly be taxed. So you've got to adjust for that. And if you're a higher rate taxpayer, a good chunk of that could go in tax. But broadly speaking, and particularly if we're talking a workplace pension where maybe your employer's putting money in or would even put extra in if you put extra in, you know, other things being equal, and again, this is someone who's 48, so they've got time to ride out the ups and downs of the market. Your pension is going to be a good investment, probably going to get you a better return than getting your mortgage down quicker. We'll talk about the ups and downs of the market shortly. But Simon, is this a popular question that you get asked? Should I pay off my mortgage? Yeah, very much so. It's one of those things, isn't it, that people still people aspire to. Actually, through the very low interest rate years, it's actually something that maybe was not quite so worthwhile doing if you look at it from the point of view of what return can I get on my money and the hurdle that you had to beat on your mortgage which bear in mind you need to take into to account the fact that paying off your mortgage is quite tax efficient because otherwise the gains that you might be getting the interest you might be getting on savings the gains you might be getting on investments might be taxed so unless you're comparing it to an ISA so you need to do those two things but actually you know when your mortgage rates 1.4 percent as a long-term investor over many years you would be hoping to get a better return than that from your investments so actually you probably might have been better off putting the money into investments but that does totally fail to take into account the one key ingredient for a lot of financial success and that is automation which takes things out of your hands because the great thing about paying your mortgage is you have to keep paying it. They, they, they take that money off you every single month. Um, and if you overpay a chunk, it's gone, you've overpaid it, that's cleared, and then you can chip away at it quicker. The problem with investing and saving is that, yes, you could say, well, if you just invest your money every single month, you'll get a better return than 1.4% and you'll be quids in. But it's how many people actually manage to keep up that investing every single month and that saving every single month. It's very easy to cut back on that. Now, obviously, we're in a totally different scenario. And we're looking potentially at new fixed rate mortgages at around the three and a half percent mark, four percent mark. And all of a sudden, beating that if you then take into account potentially tax on top becomes quite a bit harder. So I think actually we might see a switch towards an environment where the whole idea of getting that mortgage cleared earlier becomes more popular again. All right, then from a teacher, I've learned I won't receive a full state pension despite making national insurance contributions for 35 years because, Steve, I was contracted out without my knowledge. What does this mean, Steve? Explain the, the surrounding issue first. And I would say this is probably the most common question we get. You know, we, we all use this shorthand that you need 35 years of national insurance for, for a full new state pension. And that is a shorthand. There's a bit missing from that sentence, which is as long as you were paying full rate national insurance. So you paid the full rate of NI, 35 years, full state pension. But lots of people didn't. And the reason they didn't is they were in an occupational pension scheme, like the teachers, like a big company pension scheme. And those schemes were what was called contracted out. They did a deal a deal with the government and they said we as employers want to pay less national insurance our workers our teachers or whoever will pay less national insurance and in return for that privilege we will replace part of your state pension at retirement it was a deal you paid less in you get less out now the teacher who's asked the question quite rightly says well no, i didn't know anything about that and of course often in the workplace you wouldn't because you were paying reduced contracted out national insurance but so was the teacher at the next desk so was the next person in the staff room everybody was paying contract so you didn't feel you were paying less but you were you were paying less than your next door neighbor on the same wage who wasn't contracted out so the short version you paid less in you get less out but of course you get your teacher's pension on top is there anything you can do in this situation 
there is the the funny thing about the new state pension is it came in in 2016 and as at 2016 they do what i've just described they they take something off the state pension for those years when you put less in but from 2016 onwards each extra year that you work or perhaps pay voluntary national insurance i use this phrase burns off that deduction so if you have quite a lot of years post 2016 you burn off the money that's been knocked off for past contracting out and you can eventually if you've got enough years post 2016 build up to the full £185.15 state pension and get your teacher's pension on top. So paradoxically, this new state pension that people get cross about if they were contracted out because they're not quite getting the full amount. If they've got enough mm. years in, they can get the full enhanced new state pension and a teacher's pension on top, which is kind of win-win. But of course, it's complicated and, and people don't get that. Uh, Tanya, as Steve said there, it's uh, one of your most common questions. You've done a lot on contracting out, haven't you? Uh, we did when the new state pension was first launched in 2016. We do le less so now, but people seem to come to it new all the time. It's fresh to them. And that is why Steve gets so many questions about it. So many that actually um, in the automated reply that people get when they send him a question, there is a link to his most classic column on this topic, <laughs> in my opinion, which was a a question very similar to this one actually but from a civil servant uh, that's really how we deal with it now and it's amazing how new angles come up on this topic and when we do get a new angle on it Steve tends to answer it because there's just so much interest in it every time he does a column on the topic it, it gets really high readership. Steve I mean, you talk about the new state pension and actually the next question is from a 73 year old why do younger people retiring under the new post 2016 system get higher payments than I do this doesn't seem fair. And again that's another question we get quite a lot and I think the reason it looks unfair is people compare apples and oranges and by what what I mean by that is the new state pension is a single figure a flat rate this £185.15. The old state pension had different bits we had a basic pension, currently about £141, but that wasn't all that employees built up. If they were not in a company scheme or something like that, they would get an additional state pension, often called STIRP, SERP, state second pension and so on, back in the 1960s, graduated retirement benefit, extra bits. And in a sense, what you have to do is compare the new flat rate figure, which is like everything in one, with all the different bits of the old one put together. And overall, the new system is about as generous as the old one, because I was in government when we brought it in. And I can assure you, the Treasury didn't just hand me a checkbook and say, Steve, why don't you just spend more on state pensions? They said, we want you to spend less. So actually, on average, the new scheme is about the same as the old one. Actually, in the long term, it's cheaper, funny enough. That doesn't mean there aren't individuals for whom there is a difference. Self-employed would be an obvious example. The self-employed used to just get the old basic 141. Now they can get the new enhanced 185. So there are gainers. There are some losers, some men who would have built up higher old state pensions, get less under the new system. So I wouldn't say there aren't people for whom there's a bit of a difference or a cliff edge, but it's not the case that the government just decided to throw money at new pensioners at the expense of old ones. All right, then, from a concerned mum. My 41-year-old son has started a new job on a four-year contract, but there's no pension scheme. Isn't it compulsory for employers to offer one now? Well, Steve, isn't it? It is if you are an employee. And there's a difference between being an employee and being self-employed, and there's a whole grey area in between those two. So if you have a contract of employment, it is a legal duty if you earn more than £10,000 a year and your age between 22 and state pension age for your employer to automatically enrol you within the first three months into a pension scheme. You're then free to opt out, but if you don't, they have to put money in, you put money in. If you're self-employed, traditional self-employed, you know, you run your own business or whatever, well, you're your own boss, you do your own pension arrangements, there's no duty. But these days there is this kind of grey area and Uber drivers were the classic example until recently, you know, were they self-employed because they could clock on when they wanted to, they were their own boss, or they employed because they worked for Uber and, and all the rest of it. And the courts eventually decided that Uber drivers actually had a right to a pension. So a lot on the question is, question is well this four-year contract is it employment is it self-employment is it you know and there are very tight legal definitions but we do in the weekly column come hear from people who say you know we were often for a small firm uh, and they didn't put me in a pension and they are breaking the law if you're employed mm. and so you know a lot depends on the exact nature of the employment four years seems a long time Simon is this about IR35 and all that well, there's a fiendishly complicated topic for people to deal with. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it could be. I don't know the ins and outs here. But what I do know is that 
we need to do more in this country to encourage self-employed people to save into pensions. Um, also, enrolment has been a huge success in terms of dramatically increasing the number of people who are regularly saving into a pension. Uh, the simple fact that you have to opt out rather than opt in makes all the difference, it turns out, as, as was hoped. And the, the contributions are being ratcheted up. I think I'm putting, I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth here, but I think Steve thinks those contributions should probably be higher potentially for employers, I think, is one of the key elements. But we don't have that system for self-employed people. So we have to rely on them doing not the right thing that's not the right phrase to use but but doing the sensible thing mm. putting the money aside but it, it can feel like a lot of money that's coming out and certainly the problem is of course is that saving is a habit and when you start up and you're self-employed that's when money is likely to be tightest and then if you then all of a sudden somewhere down the line when things start to, to go a bit better you know maybe so when my wife set, set up as self-employed to give an example I said so you give yourself six months before you start paying into a pension but then you need to start doing it she was employed before that so she had a pension that had been built up through employment I said look you've got that it's decent you've got a decent pension you built up through employment you can afford to give yourself that six months but after that you need to start paying money into a pension because the problem is the longer you leave it the more it suddenly feels like oh god that's a lot of money I'm taking out so yeah we need to do more to get people saving who are self-employed um, and and help them work out not just what they do to set up a pension, but like the ways and means of going, okay, do I do I do it every month? Do I do it in a lump sum? I mean, a lot of self-employed people will get used to putting money aside for their tax bill, which comes is a big lump sum. And quite often, many will be overcautious and put aside too much money for their tax bill. So it's like when you find out that you've put aside too much money for your tax bill, what do you do with that extra bit? What we need to be saying to them is maybe put some of that into your pension kind of mm. thing. Steve, how do you square that circle? What do we do? Well, I suppose I was just struck by this this lady whose son wasn't quite sure, and she wasn't quite sure whether he counted or not, whether he should be in pension or not. And and if it looks as though an employer is failing in their duty to enrol you, there are you can be a whistleblower, you can report an employer to the pensions regulator, who do have you know who have fined tens of thousands of small, mainly small firms for not doing this properly. So I think the the key advice here is is to check the nature of the employment. But if it, you know if it looks like a regular job, and and as Simon said, four year contracts quite striking here um, then you know challenging the employer and then being ne if necessary anonymously being a whistleblower it's difficult if you're the only employee in a firm obviously because they'll be pretty obvious who's blown the whistle but you know there are ways of, of challenging this and in terms of saving as self-employed people do we need to have some sort of an auto enrollment for self -employed? could you even do that I think the best way would be through the tax return process because about two million self-employed people a year file a tax return and at that point, HMRC could work out the tax bill and add a pension figure. Uh, maybe, I think, to get it started with the government bonus, you know, when you start your self-employed pension account, the government puts the first £500 in or something like that. And then you'd have all the financial experts saying to self-employed, well, this is a no-brainer, you've got to do this. And then again, you could have an opt-out. But if it was done for you, as you know, in this way that Simon was describing about making it as automatic as possible, then I think a lot of self-employed people would say, well, actually, I just didn't know which pension to choose. I didn't know how to do it. You've done it for me. I won't opt out. And you, that could be an annual decision with the tax return. All right, then. So I did say that I'd talk about the market turmoil because the next question is, is related to this. Lots of people suffering huge falls in the value of invested pension pots at the moment, given, of course, the current tough financial market conditions. So let's take a look at three of the concerns your readers have. So three questions, a saver about to retire, someone in their 70s, and from someone still saving. Now, Steve, I imagine some of the answers here are going to be quite similar, but let's go through them one by one. So the first one is, since my provider moved me into what they described as a glide path with low risk, my pension pot has reduced in value by 15 grand since they did this about eight months ago. I'm only three months away from retirement. Is this really low risk, they are asking, Steve? And there used to be a traditional view, which was what they called lifestyling. So you spend your 20s, 30s and 40s building up, perhaps adventurously investing for a bit of risk and a bit of growth and so on. And then the theory was you gradually took your foot off the gas, eased off on all the investment risk, moved into bonds and things like that, rather than into equities. So, you know, things that you would have thought would be more stable. And I think the investment 
profession has had a bit of a shock because they've been moving money into things which have turned out to be just as volatile as the things they were moving out of. And this wasn't widely foreseen, but the last few months, few years has seen volatility on shares and volatility on bonds and, and indeed some falls. So I think it, the, the intentions were there, the best of intentions, but what's actually happened, as, as the reader has seen, is some quite nasty falls. Um, whether they would have happened anyway if they'd stayed in equities, I think there must be some chance of that. Um, and of course, you can't undo that. I mean, that was mm. a design feature. What you have to avoid, I think, is if you're not planning at retirement to be very low risk and buy an annuity or pension or something like that, if you're going to go on investing for decades into retirement, you probably don't want to be de-risking in the run-up to retirement. And if your pension provider is planning to de-risk you, when actually you don't want that to happen, you need to make sure that they know uh, when you're planning to retire. <clears throat> and, you know, so avoid... De- you know, even attempts to de-risk that could damage your pension. But, you know, everybody's got burned in the last few years, to be honest, unless they were really diversified. Um, what can you, you know, do in this situation, though, Steve? Because that's 15 grand. That's that's a substantial amount of money. It, it is. And that is money that's gone, as it were. You can't sort mm. of just get that back. I think, again, as ever, it's time horizons is the issue here. You know, if you look at this over a three month period and put it on a graph, it looks appalling. If you look over a 20 year period, you probably barely notice it on the graph. Do you know what I mean? So I think if as long as you can have a long time horizon, you can write these things out. But you do want to make sure that if you need a set amount of money in a short period of time, that you're looking very carefully at what you're invested in and thinking fresh. I think about what low risk really means, because it clearly means, you know, what we thought was low risk has turned out not to be. Simon, the investment industry's had a bit of a shock, says Steve. The whole world had a bit of a shock that led to the sudden um, collapse in in bond yields uh, in during uh, when the financial crisis arrived. And we've had a few shocks since. I think the one thing that the investment industry didn't anticipate was the spectacular stock market returns of the of the US that just kept going and going and going. And the success of some of those highly disruptive firms, the tech stars within it, that just kept making money hand over fist. After many times that people have said, no, no, that's it for them. Then these these profits aren't going to continue. They just they just kept coming back. We've seen a lot of volatility there. Um, over the past six to nine months, and we've seen some some big share price falls. We saw the S and P five hundred fall twenty percent in the US, but then it staged a staged a big rally, and then it's fallen back again. But this is the thing is is that that because of the makeup of the global stock market and the fact that the US makes up about sixty percent of it, and then a number of companies within that US stock market generate a lot of the returns and dominate it. If you go digging into your pension, you might find that you you potentially own more of Apple than you do of the UK. Um, and, and so it's a slightly weird scenario. So you can understand how the investment industry got slightly caught out, but there has long been an issue, I think, where too much of people's pensions is invested into stuff that is seen as steady and stable and that's at the expense of the the growth and the dividends that the stock market can give you um and it turned out that actually as steve said those steady and stable assets turned out to be the government bonds turned out to be hugely volatile what but the thing is is then time and again we've seen a moment of crisis and actually they did stand up in some way as a sort of when the stock market did fall they did you know they did at least provide some ballast on the other side i think the difficulty now is for people who are investing their own pensions making the decision as to what they do in terms of getting that retirement fund to last them all the way through and and how do they then balance that and it isn't the case now that you invest your way to absolute stability at 65 and then buy an annuity with that money it's for most people they're remaining invested and they they need to get an element of both income and growth and protection all right second question here uh, my pension steve was valued at ninety four thousand last year now it's worth seventy four thousand, and this is after propping it up with four thousand extra i'm now 71 and was thinking of taking my tax free 25 percent this year but the losses are as you can hear, devastating. What can I do? Well, they are. And I think the the first thing that strikes me, and, and, you know, 
obviously I hugely sympathise with the reader, but if you are 71 and losses are devastating, then I wonder if you're taking too much risk. I know hindsight's a wonderful thing and so on, but you know, um, you've got to match the amount of risk you're taking with the amount of risk you can live with. And if you are really heavily dependent on a pot of money and you're taking quite a lot of investment risk in the hope it will do well, you've got to recognise there's a potential significant downside. And all right, it's probably been more than anyone thought, but certainly if this is central to your planning, just making sure you understand the level of risk you're taking and that it's appropriate. And sometimes, you know, you know, financial advice isn't the answer to everything. But, you know, if it's a serious part of your retirement planning, even a one off review with an advisor to just look at the mix of what you're in, uh, you don't necessarily need to pay them one percent a year for the rest of your life. But just get somebody, an expert to look at what you're doing and make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, I mean, the, the other observation I would make is, um, you know, I'm not immune from this, you know, I've took out uh, equities, uh, stocks and shares ISA at Christmas, I've got less money in it now than I've put in, um, I have a pension from the company I used to work for, that's gone down significant DC pension recently, and the one thing that I try not to do is check it every day. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, there is a risk here is that if you are constantly sort of worrying and checking and getting anxious and so on, you know, I, I restrict myself to once a month and that's probably too often, you know, as long as you are able to take a reasonable time horizon, not checking it too often avoids the risk that you overreact and that, you know, the argument is that the amateur investor sells at the bottom and the professional buys at the bottom and that's the risk, you know, you see it go down, you panic, you sell and that locks in your losses. Whereas the professional investors are thinking, oh, this looks quite cheap now. They pile in and they get the upside. So just not over. I mean, of course, you know, it's, I don't want to be glib about this. There's a lot of money to someone later in their retirement. Mm. But trying to avoid overreacting to short term market movements is important. Which leads us on to the next one. I'm sure similar answer to this one. But this is for people who are saving. I hear this quite a lot, though, not the amount that's being saved into the pension. Uh, the reader currently saves 35 percent into the pension, into their pension. And my employer is paying five percent per month. I paid six hundred and ninety two pounds last month. And within 10 days, I'd lost over eight hundred pounds. I understand the stock market has ups and downs. I'd like to know, am I throwing good money after bad or have I actually bought stocks and shares with the money I put in each month? Should I keep investing, Steve? And it's slightly worrying is that the reader doesn't quite know what's happening to their money. And I think the pensions industry has got a lot to answer for there, because if you're putting 35 percent of you know, what would you put spend 35 percent of your pay on and not know what you'd got for it? It's only in finance and investment, isn't it? I think contacting the pension provider at the very least and saying, well, where, where is my money going? You know, get it, look, re, actually probably reading an annual statement or a glossy or something. So first of all, just finding out what you're invested in. But if the employees, I don't know, in their 40s or 50s, potentially investing for decades up to retirement and through retirement, then yes, it's bumpy at the moment, but over the medium term, this is the way that you are going to get growth. So I think sticking with it is generally going to be the right answer. But as, as I said previously, Previously, uh, probably not checking it too often. Tanya, is this an issue that people just have simply no idea where their money's going? Or actually, would it be beneficial to know? Would people want to change anything? Could they change anything? I mean, what what, do you, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, you can change up your investments if you're in a defined contribution pension. Would people have the confidence to do that? Well, this is it. You do have to learn a bit about investing if you're going to do this. What the, the big employers tend to do is have a walled garden of funds. So you're not looking at thousands and thousands of funds. They, they may have, you know, 20 or so that you can choose from. And they're all very heavily labelled with, you know, cautious or balanced or, you know, high risk or emerging markets and, and so on. And so then you can you can try and uh, and research them. Um, but most people do stick with their default fund. I mean, the the rule of thumb that the industry gives you is always that 90 percent of people in a uh, defined contribution workplace pension, they stay with their default fund. They usually are picked to be a sort of one size fits all and not to go overboard in losing people money because obviously employers don't want <laughs> their employees to to suffer that. But if you if you do think that you want to take more of an interest in it, because at retirement, you're going to have to take an interest in any way so why not start early then it might be a good idea to um to have a look at changing up some of your investments or just changing um the way they're they're allocated going from one default fund to five different funds with 20 percent in each you know that kind of approach 
All right. The next question we've got, I know we've discussed it on the podcast. I know it's made lots of headlines recently, but which is why I thought it would be good to put it in here. But I'm 74 years old and a beneficiary of the old state pension. Is it your opinion that the triple lock will be applied in 2023, 2024 without modification as happened this year? Steve, what are your views on that? So, as you know, Georgie, the triple lock says when they're setting the pension each year, how much do they put it up by? Do they put it up to keep pace with prices in the shops? Do they put it up in line with what people in jobs are getting by wage growth? Or do they at least put it up by 2.5% regardless? Those are the three elements of the triple lock. Well, we forget 2.5. That's that's not going to come into the equation this year. So the choice would be wage growth, which I forget the exact figure of 6 6 7%, something like that, or inflation, which we assume in September, which is the crucial month, will be 10%-ish, maybe slightly more. Um, my assumption is, yes, they will do that. Um, you know, we don't know, but um, they broke it, as, as the reader says, this April. It was a manifesto commitment. And when they broke it this year, they said definitely next year. And people were sceptical when they said definitely next year. And I said to them, yeah, but you'll have that decision before you vote next time around. So, you know, they will be very aware of the politics of this. Older people are more likely to vote, more likely to vote for the current government on average. So they will be very sensitive to the politics of breaking it again. So although a 10% rise in the state pension is, you know, is over 10 billion pounds on public spending, they are getting money in because of inflation. You know, they've frozen the tax threshold. So as we earn more, they're getting more income tax. So although it's expensive, they are they do benefit from inflation in some respects as well so i think i think the politics are such it would be incredibly difficult especially with you know soaring energy bills and all the rest of it to actually not do the triple lock this year what do you make of all the articles that have been written across the the media about this intergenerational unfairness it is a challenge because if people in work are getting 6% or 7% on average, and I'm sure there are plenty of people listening who've got less than that, um, and pensioners get 10%, is that fair? On the other hand, you have to remember that this year, just gone, pensioners got 3%. So if you've had a pay rise of 5 or 6% this year, that's more than the average pensioner got. And the average pensioner, you know, some elderly married women are on £85 a week, you know, 3% of £85 a week wasn't a great deal. So... Um, I think a pensioners have felt the squeeze a lot this year, you know, high energy bills and not the pension rise. So in a sense, next April is a bit of a catch up. And I think the second thing is, you know, actually, when I think of the next generation, many of whom won't have generous company pensions. And as we said before, probably there's not enough money going into their own pension. The state pension really matters to them. Mm. You know, if, if I think of today's workers, the last thing they need is to retire on a shrunk down state pension. So although it, it's difficult, we do need to think about the different generations. I don't think squeezing the state pension helps anybody. really. Uh, Simon, on your website, you had a poll about this from your readers as to whether they agreed with it. It should go up um, to the fullest extent. And it was pretty unequivocally in favour of it should go up. Uh, your views? Yes, it was. And I think maybe you have to take into account that that poll was not representative of the public at large. So, you know, self-selecting potentially in terms of the answers. But a lot of people did answer it. The thing I would say, though, is a, when this debate was going on a year ago as to whether the triple lock should be kept, the thing that was causing the problem was wages. And that wage figure wasn't an accurate representation of what was going on with people's wages. It was being massively skewed by the return from furlough uh, after COVID, the COVID recovery and things like that. So people weren't genuinely getting those pay rises on average. We're in a different scenario now where that inflation figure isn't being skewed by something, you know, by by something like that. The, yeah. the inflation figure is a genuine inflation figure. Um, and so I think, you know, it's not a directly comparable thing. And I think they should pay it because they they didn't do it last time around so they've got to do it this time around and i think steve's point's really interesting there is that actually if you are a worker yes you are paying for pensions but hopefully one day you will get a state pension i'm hoping it'll still be around when i retire and actually if a state pension increase in line with inflation of 10 percent is paid now then over the years the extra increases on top of the state pension will do that thing that we call magic they'll compound so actually when we retire will be getting more money as well um and i think at the moment i'm looking at the figures and wages are going up including bonuses 
the average is 5.1%, but regular pay is was 4.7%. And that's an interesting element is that a lot of companies are rather than paying people the inf inflation matching wage increases, they're saying, well, we'll put your wages up by X amount and we'll give you a one-off bonus. Steve, can you just answer a question for me? Why is it that the figure goes up in line with inflation around about now, as opposed to perhaps, say, March, a month before? So it'd be a little bit more accurate. And a lot of this dates back to the days when people had to have printed order books to take into the post office. Uh, if you imagine that you've got, what have we got today, 12 million pensioners or something like that, plus all the people on other benefits. And if you left it until March, you don't get the March inflation figure till April. And so you know, there's a lead time, essentially. Now, in the days of computers, that's a, a lot less, but we've kind of got into this pattern. You use the September inflation figure, which doesn't appear till October. They have a budget in November where they announce their plans. They've then got a few months to set all the new rates, print all the new leaflets and so on. So it's it's as much practical. And as long as from one year to the next, inflation's reasonably stable, it doesn't really matter which month you pick. It's just at the moment where things have just gone completely you know, out of kilter. But I thought Simon made a really important point there that we're talking about averages. And actually for pensioners, the evidence is that even the average inflation figure is too low because energy and food and things like that are yeah. a big proportion of their budget. So even an inflation rise might still leave them squeezed. All right, quick one, Steve. Next up is from someone who started drawing a state pension but has had second thoughts. Can they still defer? They can. You can unretire. You can only do it once, uh, but you can say to the DWP, please stop paying me a pension. Uh, and then when you start it off again, you get the reward for having put it off. So you get five or six percent extra a year on your pension for each year you put it off and you can, as it were, change your mind once. But you can't keep doing it. You can't yeah. treat it like a kind of cash machine. Um, and a surprising number of people do, you know, unretire. I think it's about one in four men or something goes back to work within four within five years of retiring. So it's 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 uh, something you can change your mind about, but but don't make a habit of it. All right, then. Um Question I get asked a lot is how does the top up system work and is it actually worth it? Is it a good idea to buy more national insurance years? I would generally say that voluntary national insurance is a very good deal. Uh, one of the best deals out there. I know it might sound a bit like a dodgy used car salesman in saying that, but um, essentially you pay a lump sum of voluntary national insurance. That's usually a bit over £800. And then you get an extra amount every year on your pension, typically about £275 at current rates. So if you do the maths, four lots of 275 means you've recovered your money within about four years, allowing for tax and everything after that's profit. So first question, are you going to live for four years? And, you know, if you're very, very poorly, maybe not a good idea. Second thing to just check, are you on benefits? because a pound extra of pension could mean a pound less of benefit, so not a good idea. But broadly speaking, except for those two cases, this can be one of the best things that you can do. Now, you have to check is the one thing. There are some cases where you can buy a, a year years ago and it doesn't help your pension because of the way it's worked out. So before you hand over a penny, ring the Future Pension Centre at DWP, check with them. They will then check it's OK. They'll give you the HMRC details, and that's important because you don't just want to send a check to the government and hope it will end up in the right mm -hmm. place. It needs all the right reference numbers and so on. But in principle, uh, and there's a deadline next April, so at the moment you can go back if you're on the new state pension, you go back to 2006. That deadline will end, and you'll only be able to go back six years after next April. So well worth looking at now, if you're particularly if you're on the new state pension. Tanya from Reader GF, I am. 40 <laughs> I have maybe I don't know 21 years of national insurance contributions I might have missed one or two years is it worth not me obviously this is GF uh, worth them um, purchasing a, a year or so at this age well it depends how much you're going to earn in national insurance between now and retirement age when people have asked Steve this in the past, he's he's always been more in favour of of waiting just to make sure that you you don't do it un, unnecessarily if you're if you're still uh, fairly young. It seems a bit of a waste to, to do it now when you've got so many more good years in you. Um, fingers Georgie, crossed, Tanya. Fingers um, crossed. Mm -hmm. GF, reader GF, by the way. Yeah, I and mean, just just say hypothetical reader GF. Let's supposing she's forty-ish. I think was the figure you gave. Um, 40, her pension age forty-ish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, might be 68 let's say so that's 28 more years to go if you've already got if she or he has already got 20-ish in the bank you only need another 15 mm. and you've got 
28 or whatever. So paying now and then you still have to pay national insurance even if you've hit the target. You know, as long as you're working, you have to go on paying even if you've got a maximum pension. So uh, you'd have to be quite cautious, I think, to spend money now. You could always save it and pay a bit later if needs be. All righty. Steve, what are the rules for taking 25% lump sums from final salary and defined contribution pension pots? We've mentioned the 25%, but let's go a little bit more into uh, the details. And this is another one that comes up surprisingly often. People say things like, well, do I have to do it all at the same time? The answer, no. These are entirely separate transactions. So unless you're worrying about hitting you know, lifetime allowance limits and that kind of thing, basically each pot is separate. Each decision to take 25% is separate. You can take tax-free cash from one pension and no tax-free cash from another. You can mix and match. Some company pensions will allow you to vary that percentage. So you might take 20% tax-free cash and a bit more regular pension. So it's, it's very flexible. You can, as long as you're currently 55 would be the minimum age in most pensions, as long as you're over that minimum age you can choose when to do it you don't have to do it at 55 because you can or 60 because that's the normal age so it's it's very flexible the other thing i'd say is it's quite simple with pot of money defined contribution pensions it's just kind of a quarter of the pot in most cases it's a bit more messy with defined benefit pensions because they work it out in quite a complicated way and sometimes they don't give you a very good deal so although you know who doesn't like tax-free cash you have to remember they're knocking quite a lot off your regular pension if you take some of it as tax-free cash and sometimes it's quite eye-watering how much they're knocking off so if you don't actually need that tax-free lump sum and what you really need is a good regular pension don't assume that taking tax-free cash is always the best thing to do because mm. sometimes they've converted it on a very unfavorable basis goodness me we've been rattling through these questions well done everybody because we've got to our last one i want to use 25 percent tax-free lump sums from my three pensions to help my daughter buy a house steve is this a workable plan they asked well in theory uh, in the sense that it's it's just cash. Kind of thing. And once you've taken it out, it is just your money to use as you wish. There's no kind of restriction on what you, what you then do with it. Um, and I know, I think a lot of people who are in that fortunate position, perhaps they've got more retirement provision than they need, are very much looking to help the next generation. I think, I'm pretty sure we wrote a column and a gentleman wrote in, I think it was about what I called giving while living. And rather than, you know, wait till I'm 90 and pass on to my 60 year old children who may not thank me for making them wait till, till I'm, I'm gone and they're 60, thinking about some of your wealth, if you don't need it. And, you know, the caveat as ever, well, will you need this money yourself? Not leaving yourself short. What if you need care or other costs later in life? So so be just being a bit careful about not giving away more than than you actually need but in principle helping the next generation uh, get on the housing ladder and I think the reader who wrote in said uh, yes I, I I did this they were able to buy a bigger house as a result and they have a spare room and I now go and stay in it so enlightened self-interest in that case I guess absolutely Simon your views the intergenerational transfer of wealth is going to be a topic that just runs and runs and runs over the next few years um, due to the extremely high house prices in this country compared to wages. They are now at a record high by comparison to wages, an unwelcome byproduct of the pandemic housing market boom that we really didn't need and added another 20% to the cost of the average home. We are in a scenario where people are relying on the bank of mum and dad or the bank of gran and granddad even more mm -hmm. to get onto the property ladder because put simply trying to save tens of thousands of pounds at least from scratch is really 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 hard and it's made much harder when your bills are going up by the most and if you look at the people who are most hit by the cost of living crisis you've got pensioners you've got uh the the low pays um and then you've got younger people the people who are who are renting and trying to save that money for for a house deposit so actually giving that money away if you don't genuinely need it and you're not going to need it um, before you die and well in advance at a time when not only do you get to see your um, your children perhaps benefit from it but you also get to benefit from it yourself by going and staying at their bigger house I, I would say that's that's a, a good move and we talked on the podcast actually uh, a few weeks ago about 
this sort of concern among people about inheritance tax and you know lots of, it's a very hated tax despite the fact that not that many people pay it more people are paying it but not that many people pay it but the you know there's some good ways to avoid inheritance tax one of which is obviously to give your money away well in advance and survive for another seven years and the other way is to spend more money on yourself uh, because you deserve it <laughs> to get used to the idea that you are in what is in jargon terms decumulation rather than accumulation and you don't want to be having more money in your account at the end of every month if you are someone who is retired and has an inheritance tax liability mm. all right we've come to the end of all our questions i have one further question for you steve just um it's a hard one and it always is when you're, you're asked to look to the future but what do you think that over the coming years, the issues with pensions in your next 300 columns uh, are going to focus on. Obviously, there will be things that you will not know, hopefully less scandals to uncover. But where do you think the focus will lie? I think we've touched on it a bit, and it's this whole post-retirement period, because, you know, we've had a huge focus on getting people saving, automatic enrolment, 10 million people now saving for the first time. That's fantastic. A bit of focus on what happens at retirement, so the Financial Conduct Authority trying to nudge people down investment pathways and sort of trying to get them started in the right sort of way. But what we've kind of forgotten is that people are then still managing a pot of money for 20, 25, even 30 years, and virtually no serious policy thought has gone on to what you know okay you've got a seventy thousand pound pension pot at 65 and maybe that's dwindled to thirty thousand at 82 what, are we expecting 82 year olds to be managing parts making decisions coping with the volatility of the markets we talked about today and if not if for example maybe an annuity later in retirement starts to become a better deal because it just gives you that locked in certainty are we expecting people to shop around for annuities at 83 to you know and if not how do we nudge people into that so I think that whole area about what happens post-retirement we haven't yet had the pension freedoms generation as I call them the people who've since 2015 not had to buy an annuity get into their late 70s get into their 80s and I think if an, an environment that's safe for them has the right amount of return the right amount of risk we're not there yet and I think a lot of work needs to be done there. All right Steve well thank you very much thank you for your last 300 columns thank you for the last hour and thank you for the ones that are to come that's it for this week if you have any comments or questions for the team or anything you'd like them to look into simon you can email us at editor at this is money.co.uk you can tweet us at this is money and you can come to this is money.co.uk forward slash podcast to find all podcasts past and make sure you come on monday for the next edition of steve's column <laughs> and if you like our podcast why not rate us wherever you found us it helps other people find us too